Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna. This is the preview show sponsored by Loserpool.com where traditional betting has been turned on its head. You stand to predict your way to cash prizes by picking the losers each week. Why not give it a try? It's great fun and there are some excellent cash prizes to be won. Head over there now and check it out. Aside from the standard bit of promotion for our sponsor, I have to say that the team over at Loserpool is a phenomenal group of people to work with, in particular Chris who heads things up. He's always on hand to provide us with any support we need and without their faith in this show we wouldn't be able to produce as much content as we do. So thank you very much to Chris. On this week's preview show, we'll be talking about Petr Cech's announcement, the under-23s thrashing of Manchester City, Sven Mislintat and his potential departure, and we get the lowdown on Chelsea. After all, this is the preview show. My guest this week is a Chelsea fan. He's also a very well-known radio presenter, the host of the Chelsea Fancast, and regularly appears on TalkSport, where he'll be appearing this Thursday with me. It's David Chigi, a.k.a. Stamford Chidge. He'll be joining me a little later on in the program to assist me in previewing Saturday's game. And of course, on the review show scheduled for release on Tuesday morning, I'll be joined by former Arsenal striker Jeremy Aliadier. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already. If you're listening via the audio on iTunes or any other platform, please do leave us a review and give us a follow or a subscribe, depending on where you're listening from. Going forward, you will also be able to find all our episodes on our website. Yes, we have a website. We just haven't used it all that much, but it's about time that changed. So head over to www.chroniclesafc.com and check it out. Let's begin by talking about the announcement to come out of Petr Cech's camp earlier on this week. Having spent 11 years at Chelsea, Cech joined the Arsenal in June 2015. He arrived with a huge reputation and rightly so. There was even talk at the time that his influence could see us end our 11-year wait for a Premier League title. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be, but that's hardly his fault, is it? The reality is we failed to topple Claudio Ranieri's Leicester City that year and missed a huge opportunity to capitalise on freak circumstances. The only silver lining at the end of that season being Spurs finishing third in what was supposedly a two-horse race between them and the eventual champions. How very Spursy of them. Now, having this is what Petr Cech had to say. Having played 15 years in the Premier League and won every single trophy possible, I feel like I've achieved everything I set out to achieve, said the veteran goalkeeper. I will continue to work hard at Arsenal to hopefully win one more trophy this season. Having played 15 years in the Premier League and won every single trophy possible, I feel like I've achieved everything I set out to achieve, said the veteran goalkeeper. I will continue to work hard at Arsenal to hopefully win one more trophy this season. Czech then added, This is my 20th season as a professional player and it has been 20 years since I signed my first professional contract. So it feels like the right time to announce that I will retire. I'm looking forward to seeing what life holds for me off the pitch. Maybe now he'll join a rock band and show off his unbelievable drumming skills. If you haven't already seen that shit, check it out. Um, Petr Cech, very talented musician. Um, Cech, of course, first arrived in England back in 2004, having been picked up by Chelsea from French club Rennes. During his outstanding career, he went on to win an astonishing Four Premier League titles, five FA Cups, three League Cups, four Community Shields, a UEFA Champions League where he saved the crucial penalty in the final and won Europa League. What a CV that is. In fact, the, the list of honours is so long that I had to print it out. <laughs> Jesus. Um, can't say that about many players these days, can you? 443 Premier League appearances, 202 clean sheets. And let's face it, that ratio would have taken a serious beating when he joined us, a club for whom defensive solidarity has been a real issue in the last four or five seasons. People often forget that Petter almost lost his career. He almost had it taken away from him back in 2006 when he suffered a serious head injury during a collision with Reading's Stephen Hunt. Do not underestimate the mental strength and bravery it took to recover from something like that. 
not only a great footballer, but a great man too. Now, despite joining our club in the twilight of his career, I think we can all agree that he's one of the all-time greats and deserves all the fantastic tributes that are set to come his way between now and the end of the season. I was asked earlier how I would describe Petr Cech in three words, and I came up with reliable, authoritative and calm. Um, in my mind, Petr Cech is probably the greatest goalkeeper to ever play in the Premier League when you take into account all that he's achieved and the longevity um, of his career as a Premier League goalkeeper. Uh, that is no mean feat. Do you agree with me, disagree with me? Is Petr Cech the greatest all-time uh, Premier League goalkeeper? Let me know on Twitter. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. We now turn our attentions to Arsenal's under 23s. I have to remember to say that. Emphatic victory over Manchester City's under 23s. Arsenal returned to winning ways on Monday night when they thrashed City's under 23s by five goals to one. For the first time since November, Ljungberg had a full strength side to choose from. And you could see the step up in class, really, with a front three of Bukayo Saka, Eddie Nketiah and Javier Amiachi. Arsenal caused City problems from start to finish. Saka opened the scoring inside five minutes when he cut inside from the left wing and fired into the far corner. That being his sixth goal in all competitions this season. Just a few minutes later, Amaichi broke into the penalty area and was brought down by Jaden Bruff. The referee pointed to the spot and Robbie Burton converted to double the Gunners' lead. With Arsenal having dominated the first period, Joe Willock managed to register a third just before the, gr the break Sorry, when he turned in the rebound of an Eddie Enketia effort. He won't score an easier goal in his entire career, you suspect. The visitors did, however, pull one back after the restart through Luke Bolton. He struck from close range after two brilliant saves from Dejan Ilyev in the Arsenal goal. But less than five minutes later, Bukayo Saka bagged his second and Arsenal's fourth of the evening, putting the game beyond any doubt. The route was complete on 67 minutes when 18-year-old winger Javier Ameachi I think I'm getting better at saying that name, aren't I? Fired home from close range. Arsenal's fifth and a job well done by Freddie Jumberg's side. Arsenal now find themselves in seventh place in the Premier League 2 Division 1 table. Eight points behind leaders Everton. Two positions above Spurs, who currently sit in ninth. At least we're above them in something. But the chances of us retaining our PL2 title this year... Look slim at the moment. It's an eight-point gap. And uh, given the regularity with which Unai Emery is pulling players into his sort of cup squads, you, you don't really feel that Freddie Lundberg's going to get a fair cr uh, crack at it. Um, so, yeah, uh, maybe we'll finish fourth in that at least. Now, Bukayo Saka um, looks a real exciting player in, in, in that team, doesn't he? And I've always been very wary of calling for youth players to be promoted this early in their careers. But let's face it, you know, <laughs> the step up is huge, isn't it? I mean, the step up between sort of under 23 football and first team football is huge. And, and that's probably why my attitude has been like that for many years. But at a time when we're clearly lacking a natural wide man and this kid is on shit hot form. It makes sense, doesn't it, to give him an opportunity? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let me know what you think in the comments section or, of course, via Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. According to reports, Sven Mislintat is set to leave his role as Arsenal's head of recruitment. Now, Sven Mislintat is reportedly, reportedly on his way out after what's been described as a series of disagreements over the organisational structure and transfer strategy. The man they call Goldeneye has been credited with the discoveries of Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, Ousmane Dembele and Shinji Kagawa during his days with Borussia Dortmund. Now, Raphael Honigstein, a German football expert and a fantastic journalist, someone I've had the pleasure of talking to um, on the Sofa Sports podcast, uh, wrote an excellent piece on this uh, for ESPN, which if you haven't already read, I suggest you do so. If I remember, I'll put the link in the uh, description of the video. I'll try and remember. Can't guarantee it, though. Um, the main disagreement, he, he says, is between Sven Mislintat and Raul Sanlehi in regards to their differing views over the recruitment policy 
San Leahy wanted to base the policy around using his extensive network of contacts around Europe, whereas Sven Mislintat had been initially tasked by Ivan Gazidis to follow an analytical, more statistical-based approach. The result of which brought Lucas Torreira and Matteo Guendouzi to the club over the summer. Rafael Honigstein then went on to report that contrary to what people are saying, Sven Mislinta and Unai Emery have enjoyed a very good working relationship and that the reported interest in Sven's services from Bayern has played no part in this. So what's my view on it, I hear you ask. Um, my view on it is that it kind of makes a mockery, doesn't it, of the setup that Ivan Gazidis put in place prior to his departure. And it kind of takes away some of the hope from distressed Arsenal fans at the moment who thought that Sven Mislintat's golden eye would be the solution to us being able to go out and spend the, the, the sort of money that City and United can on wages and, of course, transfer fees. But, you know, regardless of whether that's down to the fact we don't have money or whether that's down to our budget simply being mismanaged, it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, Sven Mislintat clearly has a talent for what he does and losing him will be a blow. Um there's no doubt in my mind about that. And given, you know, we don't seem to be able to sign anybody on a pers uh, permanent sorry, deal, you'd have thought we'd have had more chance of success if we were able to identify talent for low prices. And that's not something that Raul Sanlehi has a track record for. Um, but clearly, he's been given more power at the club than Mislin Tat, and the German simply isn't comfortable with that. I'm a little bit concerned at the moment uh, because it feels like those foundations put in place prior to Wenger leaving, the foundations that contributed to us believing that Unai Emery was the right man for the job are slowly coming undone. Um, it feels like a bit of a step backwards at the moment, but sometimes you need to take a step backwards in order to move forward. So I'm intrigued uh, to see how this saga will conclude but again i want to hear from you guys so tweet us or of course you can email us at chroniclesafc at gmail.com now let's look ahead to arsenal chelsea this is the preview show after all but there was a couple of key points i felt i had to mention a couple of stories that needed covering on this podcast so apologies for taking a while to get round to it but we're there now um so let's look ahead to the clash on Saturday. Maurizio Sarri and Chelsea come to the Emirates looking to extend their lead over us to nine points. The defeat we suffered at West Ham last weekend has really, really upped the stakes here. And this is now a must-win game for Unai Emery and his players. Um, you could argue that it was anyway. I don't think it was. I think had we won at the weekend, it would have just been key to keep in touch and distance of Chelsea and stay on their tails. Whereas now... It's imperative that we get all three points. Um, I was joined on Tuesday night, actually, by a very special guest uh, to get the lowdown on Chelsea ahead of this one. Uh, here's how it went. Joining me on this week's preview show is a very special guest. Uh, he is of allegiance to Chelsea, but we'll, we'll forgive him, seeing as he's <laughs> agreed to come on to the Chronicles of Aguna. It's David Chidge, known as Stamford Chidge, and the presenter of the Chelsea Fancast. Welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna, my friend. How are you doing? I'm all right, Harry. How are you, mate? Not too bad, not too bad. It's been a bit of a turbulent couple of weeks as an Arsenal fan, mm, to be yes. honest. So uh, not at my greatest, but, you know, we'll survive. There's there's clubs in far worse situations than us. Um, I want to start off by talking about the announcement that Petr Cech made today at the time of recording, um, that he will be retiring at the end of the season. Now, a lot of Arsenal fans have been paying tribute to him via social media today, and I'm sure that will go on for a few days now. But... You know, the general feeling is that, yes, we respect him and we, you know, we'll be sad to see him go. But he is a Chelsea legend, isn't he? Um, and just tell us a little bit about your thoughts on Peter Cech's career and, and what a fine servant he was to your club. Well, and indeed, and, and to the game, I think. I mean, he's had, what, 20 years, I think, as a professional. He started out at Wren before we picked him up as a fairly young lad. Uh, you know, Mourinho picked him up and we thought, who are you? Because uh, we all loved Carlo Cudicini at the time. You probably remember him because yep. he's now on the on the coaching staff. But we loved C uh, Carlo, absolutely loved him. But within about a season, Czech had absolutely pushed him out of the way. And it was clear to see why. I mean, he was an absolutely phenomenally good goalkeeper. 
Uh, and uh, so he continued to be throughout most of his Chelsea career. I mean, even, and, and you know, people often say, yeah, but, you know, when he had that awful head injury, which is, you know, thanks to that odious little shit, Stephen Hunt, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, people said, oh, he was never really the same. That's just That just wasn't true. I mean, he did have injury issues, I think, towards the end of his career with us. You know, his shoulder was playing him up, you know, which was which, which was perhaps, you know, uh, lessening in his, his ability. But he was a phenomenal, phenomenal keeper. But more important for us, he was, you know, he was the, the you know, the root of, of that a most amazing spine I think I will ever see at Chelsea. You know, with him, John Terry, Frank Lampard, Didier Drogba. Uh, and, and they were the spine of a team that achieved success, the like of which I never believed I would see. Um he was, you know, I wouldn't say he was single-handedly responsible for us winning the European Cup, but I mean, he had a massive hand to play in it. No pun intended, because he <laughs> saved the pe- he saved the penalty from Robin, yep. with a little bit of credit to Mikel for putting Robin off. Well done, Mikel. Uh, and of course, he he, you know, he had a blinder in the penalty shootout, so he was very instrumental in in us winning that. Um, but over and above all of that, I mean, he was also a leader on the pitch at, at a time when. A, Chelsea, and B, football in general, actually had leaders on the pitch. Um, but, but off it, he, he was an absolute gentleman. He, he had time for people. He's intelligent. He's well-spoken. He speaks five uh, different languages. Uh, I mean, in a sense, Harry, he's kind of a one-off. I mean, e- even to the extent that, you know, we, we would normally be thoroughly pissed off if, if any of our players ended <laughs> up going to Arsenal. But, you know, we all thought that Thibaut Courtois would, would, would you know, inherit his mantle and and be a superb player. And we kind of understood, well, you know, Czech's too good to be sitting on the bench. So fair enough. If he wants to play, he's been a great servant. Let him go. And that that rarely happens with any footballer, particularly when it goes to a rival. But with Czech, it was like, well, you know, he deserves it. We wish him the best, you know. Yeah, no, totally agree. And you know what? When you mentioned that Champions League final, actually, Normally, when rival clubs win such a prestigious trophy like the Champions League, I normally block it out of my head. I block it out of my memory because I don't want to think about it, seeing as it's the one trophy that I've not seen Arsenal win, um, of the big ones anyway. And and that is something that really bothers me, I'll be honest. Um, But I always remember that night, actually, because I was at the time seeing my now wife and I was supposed to meet her. And that Champions League final went all the way, which meant I didn't want to leave the house until it finished. And I was about two hours late and I almost blew it. (laughs) But we got away with it. So Chelsea almost cost me that as well. (laughs) Okay, well, yeah, that's a good story. I mean, I was I was there and uh, it's the greatest night of my life. It, It won't ever get better than that. That's for sure. It was very emotional. And quite unbelievable and utterly, utterly draining. But uh, I wouldn't have swapped that for the world. Now you're just rubbing it in. <laughs> I know. Well, we did like to remind you of it occasionally, don't we? Let's be yeah, fair. Yeah, that's right. Right, let's talk a little bit about the current Chelsea side, um, seeing as we meet at the weekend. Now, um, I did a commentary, actually, on Chelsea's game against Newcastle. And it was probably the first time in about three or four weeks that I'd watched Chelsea very closely um, and sort of you know, studying what they were doing in their patterns of play and trying to understand what it is that Maurizio Sarri is trying to get across to his players. Is there a danger that Maurizio Sarri is becoming a little bit predictable? Well, yeah, on the one hand, because he's very stubborn and he's not going to change, you know, he's, he's a, he's an ideologue. He's a football philosopher. So he's, he's not going to change that. There's also a sense that we've had that, He's not really bothered about um, how, how the other team sets up. Uh, does this remind you of anybody that you used to manage you? It does. You know, so, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so there is that. But the, the weird thing is, Harry, that that all changed when we played City because clearly he did change how he played. And we actually almost reverted back to the Chelsea that the Chelsea supporters kind of know and love and are very familiar with, which was more of a deep-lying side that would hit people on, on the break. And he actually played Kante a lot deeper and, and had him kind of minding Jorginho for that match, which was which was different. But I think on the whole, he likes to play one way. He's adamant that he will get these players to adapt to the way that he plays. Uh, but on the other hand, I think he's finding that difficult with the, the set of players that he's got, who, you know, repeatedly during matches, they'll, they'll, you know, Newcastle was a case in point. They started really well, kind of playing the way that Sarri wants them to. 
And then by Sarri's own admission, after the match, they all kind of went to sleep after they scored and they just get complacent. They stop playing the way he wants them to. And then that causes us problems. So, I mean, there's a real sense at Chelsea that it's it's a really big work in process, uh, progress, progress at the moment to try and, you know, adapt, A, adapt to his style and to adapt these players to his style. And there's a suspicion that there are not enough players who are really capable of playing the way that he wants them to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... From watching Maurizio Sarri during his Napoli days in particular, because I'm a huge follower of Serie A, um, it's something I'm really passionate about and watch a lot of. One of the things that always struck me about him was his reluctance to rotate his players. Um, he use, he t- likes to use a very small squad, doesn't he? Um, I think yep. at Napoli there was a, a ridiculous stat that he only used, I think, 14 players um, in the in the sort of during the league campaign by choice, of course there were other changes he had to make um, because of injuries and things like that. But in terms of his actual decisions and leaving people out and swapping people because he wanted to, he'd only used fourteen players. So you know that could lead to players getting burnt out. And I think you saw that in Napoli's uh, title challenge that faded away last season towards the end. Is is that a concern? Well, well, it is, uh, and I mean not just Napoli. I mean we've seen uh, we've seen Spurs. I mean I know that Spurs do it every year, don't they, on St. St. Totteringham's Day? But you know <laughs> I think because of the way that they play, which is very high press, very high energy. You know they t- they tend to tail off at around March, April. It happened to Liverpool, who are playing the same kind of style of football, uh, and I and you know with a similarly you know small or, or, or basically the same kind of players that they they like to use. And of course, we're now trying to play this, you know, high pressing, high energy game. And he's only using about 14 players regularly. So I, I've, I think some of them are already looking tired. I mean, Jorginho looked knackered on uh, on Saturday against uh, Newcastle, had a very poor game as a result, I think. So, yeah, it, it is a concern. Um, but I, I think he's, you know, it's not the first time that, I mean, we were arguing this on the, on the Chelsea Fancast on Monday. You know, going, oh, well, he shouldn't be playing all the same players, blah, blah, blah. Why has he got rid of, you know, the bottom line is, is that actually every manager we've had recently has done the same. I mean, Mourinho would only play with about 14 players. Uh, Conte did, you know, he, yeah. he had the he had the first 11 that he liked, and that's pretty much what he tried to stick to. So it's not the first time that's happened, but I think the difference is the kind of football they're playing. And I think it's taking a lot out of them, not just physically, but also mentally, because they're having to think, I think, a lot more about what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a player that I actually really rate um, as an opposition fan, and I've heard a lot of Chelsea uh, supporters criticising in the last few days, is Marcus Alonso. Like I said, I haven't seen a great deal of Chelsea this season, but ha- have his performances tailed off a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, weirdly, since the Spurs game, really, when they absolutely knobbed us 3-1, much as it pains me to recall it. But... Um, yeah, he had a he had a bad game that day. Uh, he also seemed to be affected by the the chance, you know, relating to the the motoring incident, shall we call it? But I I don't think really it's that. I just think I think he's just looking really leggy, to be honest. And again, that could be as a result of uh, the way that Sarri likes to play. You know, he wants him to get up and down that wing, and I'm not entirely sure whether whether he's got the legs for it. So it's a shame and it's a concern. I mean, you know what Twitter's like. You know, these days, uh, fans of, of of the club just get on the back of all the players in a way that I just can't really understand at my age. But, you know, he doesn't deserve that. He's a decent player. He's been really good for us. You know, he's been really good for us since he joined. He's, he was a revelation under Conte. And, and I personally really like him and rate him. But he's he's in poor form at the moment. There's no doubt about that. In terms of, you know, the way I've been talking, it sounds like I, Chelsea are in this dreadful form and they're going know, off the rails. And, and that's wrong. I shouldn't be going down that route. That's not my intention. Chelsea are a fantastic team with some fantastic players and a team that I'm very much afraid of, to be honest, given the way that we've been playing lately. Um, what's what's the situation with this, you know, the whole striker thing? Because Eden Hazard's been playing there of late. For me... You know, yes, he's got the ability to take on people and dribble past people and score goals and and so on and so forth. But for me, Chelsea lose a lot on the left wing when he's not there. And, you know, I guess the counter argument is that on Saturday against Newcastle, he picked up the ball, he turned, didn't he? Beat a couple of players and set up William for the winning goal. But I just, as an Arsenal fan, as someone who's watched so much of Olivier Giroud, 
I feel like he should be in the side because of his ability to bring people into the game. And, and that, is, that side of his game is very underrated. Would you agree or, or are you happy to see Hazard stay there? Well, I'm, I'm, I would agree with all of that, actually, Harry. Um, I mean, I'll take Hazard first. I think, I think he's absolutely wasted in this false nine position. Um, he, you know, he doesn't like it. We all know he doesn't like it. He's clearly taking one for the team because, uh, I mean, we know that Sarri likes to play that kind of a system. He did at Napoli, didn't he? He moved Mertens in from the wing into a central role. Um, but Hazard likes to look for the ball. He likes to have the ball. So he's not going to be the kind of player that's going to make runs into the box. And Sarri said this uh, in the presser after the Newcastle game. Uh, so, you know, the number of times, you know, somebody had the ball out wide, but there's nobody in the box. So it ends up going backwards or sideways again. And it's a real, real problem, I think. And I'm, I'm also worried that it's actually going to piss Hazard off even more, which is going to encourage him to leave at the, the end of the season. So it's a problem. I think, you know, we've also got a few injuries at the moment, and I suspect that that might have affected things a little bit. Uh, on Saturday, although although Sarri denied that. He said that he was going to do that, whatever happened. And in fact, Morata, for example, was fit. But uh, hudson Adoy, you know, could have played on the left. You know, you could play Willian uh, on the left instead of uh, of Hazard, for example, which is what they did. But frankly, that's where he likes to play and that's where he's phenomenally good. So I would stick him there. Um, talking of Giroud, I mean, obviously, Giroud came from you lot, so I was determined not to like him and, and used to <laughs> laugh at him a lot when he played for Arsenal. But he's become really popular, actually, at Chelsea. The support has really warmed to him. Um, you know, at a time when the season was going completely pear-shaped, thanks to Conte spitting his dummy out, you know, Giroud really stood up and he manned up and he had he, he was quite a leader. And, and you know, I remember he... Uh, I was there, actually. We played Southampton away and we were 2-0 down. And he was pretty much instrumental in us winning that game 3-2 and... He's a cult hero. We like him, you know, and I think he's a good player, actually, and I agree with you. He's fantastic. He's a big lump, and he'll keep the, the central defenders occupied, which is kind of what you need. He's, he's got the, the skill and the strength to hold the ball up, which means he can play other uh, other players in. And, you know, I mean, even though the stats kind of belie this, we know he's got it in him to finish and score goals. So, um, I mean, I'd have him in that side all day over Morata, who I, who I just think is a complete and utter waste of space. Uh, so, you know, but hey, I'm not the manager, mate. You know, Sarri sees something I don't and he's the one that's paid to make those decisions, isn't he? That's true. That's true. But it doesn't mean we can't have an opinion. <laughs> true. I mean, to be fair, Harry, I would do it for a lot less than Sarri gets. So, you know, they yeah. want to save some money. They just need to give me a ring. Yeah, I'll do it as well. Even the Chelsea job, I'll take <laughs> you it. Could be, you could be my assistant coach, Harry. <laughs> Let's that? do it. <laughs> and, and just finally, how do you see the game going on Saturday? Um, I've already said I'm I'm really nervous about it. Um, you know, things are not going particularly well at Arsenal at the minute. A lot of us are starting to not lose faith, but question what Unai Emery is trying to do. Um, I personally can't see the vision. I can't see what it is he's trying to achieve in the long run. And that's stopping me getting fully behind him at the minute. F obviously, Chelsea are not without their own issues. We've spoken about a few of them. Um, but, you know, in terms of Saturday, how do you see the game going? I think it's going to be really hard to call, cool, actually. Although, you know, my, my boss is an Arsenal supporter and I, I was talking, I walked in, right? I hadn't said a word to her. And the first thing she said, I suppose we better get it out of the way and talk about Saturday then. I said, <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. And she's really worried. You know, she's she's got a season ticket up there and she's really worried. She's not happy with how it's panning out for you lot at all. Clearly very disappointed in the result against West Ham last week. And she's really worried. And I said, well, I, I don't know why. I mean, you know, at the moment, we, we can't score for Toffee. I mean, we, I mean, we scored two on, on Saturday against Newcastle, but frankly, they're awful. Should have scored far more. But um, we, we don't really, you know, I think that, that, that it's not just that we don't have a striker. I think, it, it, you know, that the issue is actually, you know, further back than that. We're not getting the ball into the right areas. We don't seem to have midfielders who can contribute with goals either, which we used to have in the past. So it really worries me about scoring with any team that actually bothers to defend. So, you know, like Leicester's a classic example. They mugged us off brilliantly. They had two rows of five, basically, and we couldn't play either around them or through them, and they just sat there waiting patiently, and they hit us on the break, boom. Of course, the difference is Arsenal aren't going to do that. You know, Arsenal, Emery likes to attack. So I can see, I could see, you know, on the other hand, 
for, frankly, Harry, it'll either be a turgid nil-nil draw where they try and <laughs> uh, outpass each other, or it could have a lot of goals. You know, because we're still a bit vulnerable at the back, even though you know Sarri shored that up recently and he's done quite a good job with that. But you know, we 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 do leave spaces occasionally because you know he has the wing backs or the, the left backs and the full backs flying up. So. You know, it, it's really hard to call, I think. Um, your defence is a bit... Def- I think the problem with Arsenal at the moment really is rooted in the defence. I mean, I know you've had a lot of injuries. I mean, Rob Holding getting injured has not helped. Uh, and, I mean, he even played uh, Granite Xhaka, didn't he, in, in central defence? Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it was, what, against Bournemouth or Palace? can't remember now. But he anyway. ended up having to move into that position at least a yeah. couple of times, yeah. That's right. So, you've got problems in defence, I know that. But you've also got players that can hurt us. I mean, I like the look of uh, Aubameyang, Ab- 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 which I always struggle to pronounce. Lacazette's all right, you know. But I think the, in- the most interesting thing for Arsenal and Chelsea supporters at the moment, actually, Harry really, is the fact that there's a real similarity about both clubs at the moment. You know, both have got new managers. Both are trying to change things after, you know, like a a, a long period of playing the same kind of way. Uh, Both don't seem to be prepared to really spend the kind of money. I mean, we're not spending the kind of money we used to. And I mean, I couldn't believe what Emery came out with uh, last week about only being able to get players on loan. Don't get me started on that again. <laughs> no, I bet. I, I, I was amazed by that because, it, you know, Arsenal have got money for Christ's sake. I mean, the, I think, you know, of all the clubs in the Premier League, they probably get the second biggest match day revenue only to Man United. So it's, it astonished me. So there's a, there's a huge similarity, I think, with Arsenal. And I don't think it's any surprise, given that they're both going through some sort of a transition, that they're really close in the table. I mean, clearly what you could have done without last week was was losing to West Ham because, of course, now the, the gap's six points. So, in a sense, I would imagine that Arsenal will be more desperate to win this than Chelsea because if you do, you're only three points behind. Whereas if we do win it, we're going to be nine points ahead of you and that's going to be hard to catch. That could be fatal. I would say yeah. that, that would be it's fatal. It's a big match on Saturday, no doubt about it, mate, because of that. it's I think, you know, in a sense, it could decide who's going to be fourth and fifth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brilliant. It's been brilliant talking to you. Do you want to let our listeners know how they can find you on social media, how they can <laughs> well, listen to so they can to abuse you? me on Saturday, of course. <laughs> you know, it's been my absolute pleasure. Well, I, I'm, 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 I'm uh, at Stamford Chidge on uh, Twitter if they want to say rude things to me on Saturday when we've beaten you. <laughs> uh, none of our listeners are like that, don't worry. And, all... I, and I promise not to block. I don't, I'm, not, I'm no Stan Collie anymore. I don't block people. I actually enjoy reading that stuff. It sounds silly, but... It makes me laugh. I actually enjoy it. <laughs> you know, you know what, Harry? I've got to be honest. I mean, since I've been doing all the love sports stuff, it's quite interesting because I lived in a complete and utter Chelsea bubble before that, and uh, love sports been really good because I'm having to think about what other clubs are doing and, and be interested in, in what's happening there. And it's it's made me a much better all round person, I think, Harry. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure, mate. Pleasure, mate. Thank you. So my prediction and starting 11 um, for the weekend would be as follows. Um, I'll give you the 11 first and then we'll get to the prediction part at the end. My starting 11 would be this. Uh, Burn Leno in goal. I'd go back to a back four of uh, Bellerin, Mustafi, Socrates and Monreal. My midfield would be Xhaka and Torreira uh, with Ozil, Iwobi and Aubameyang ahead of them. And... uh, Ah, sorry, I've got that wrong. With Ozil, Iwobi and Obama Yang ahead of them. No, I got that right the first time. <laughs> and Alexander Lacazette leading the line. That's how I'd go. Um, be interested to hear what you guys think, how you would set up. Um, and the reasons for that, I feel, are the back three limits us in midfield. I feel like we, we lack creativity as a result of that. None of those centre-backs that are available are capable of uh, capable, sorry, of stepping into the midfield with the ball, getting things moving. I think we badly miss a number 10 when we play that way. I think that's been evident in recent weeks and we're too heavily reliant on our fullbacks and teams are starting to suss that out. Um, in terms of the midfield, Torreira comes back in for me. Xhaka and Torreira is Arsenal's best partnership in my opinion. Um, so that that's what I'd go with. And for me, You know, I've made no secret of my feelings on this whole Emery versus Ozil thing. I want to see Mesut Ozil back in the side. So um, that's who I'd pick. In terms of a prediction, it's a really tough one to call, isn't it? Chelsea don't need to win the game, do they? They just need to avoid defeat. Um, I think Maurizio Sarri will see it that way too. So if I have to really 
Dick Manik on the line. I'm going to go for a draw. Um, I'm going to go for a score draw just because I don't think that we're capable of keeping a clean sheet, um, let alone against a side with Eden Hazard in it. Um, so I guess it makes sense to go with 1-1. I went with 1-1 at the West Ham game, actually, um, but that didn't come off. So uh, I'm going to go 1-1 again. I'm going to stick to my guns. Arsenal 1, Chelsea 1. That is my prediction. Now, it is time for my loser pool picks of the week. Each week, I'll be providing you guys with a couple of tips for your loser pool picks. Um, head over to loserpool.com, of course, to play for your chance to win a huge cash prize. Like I said, every time a new pool starts, uh, you sign up, you pick a team to lose. If they lose, you progress to the next round. And it's kind of like a last man standing thing. But once you've used a team, you cannot use them again in that pool until it resets. Um, so, you know, you've got to be careful. You've got to be smart in the way you pick. You don't want to pick all the bottom three in the first week and then be stuck. So, yeah, it's a, it's a real good game. Check it out. Um, and so these are my picks for this week. Um, oh, gosh. I should have thought about these before I came on it. Uh, looking at this weekend's fixtures, I initially thought about selecting Leicester to lose down at Wolves, down at Molyneux. But the thing with both those sides is you never know what you're going to get from them. Both have been fantastic at times this season, but equally both have been shit from time to time. Um, so I've gone full circle and I'm going to tip you to stay away from that game completely. Do not try and predict a loser there. Um, I think that's a really, really tough one. Now, I think the obvious choice this week is to predict a Brighton defeat at Old Trafford. Uh, United continue to win under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, even if David De Gea had to make a, an array of wonderful saves at Wembley last weekend. But if you don't fancy that and you want to be a little bit more daring in your selection, then I would look at Spurs travelling to Fulham. Claudio Ranieri's Fulham. Um, look like they're getting Ryan Barbo in. They've already got some talented forward players, Andre Scherler being another one. And Spurs are going to be without Harry Kane for quite some time now. Um, so, you know, kick them while they're down. I'm going to go for, for, for Fulham in that one. So my safe option will be Brighton. But if you fancy a punt, if you fancy taking a risk, go for Spurs to get beat at Fulham. Right now, it's time to answer some of your questions, some of the questions that you guys have been sending in via social media. Big thank you to every single one of you who sent one across. Um, I'm going to pick a select few. This first one comes from Praveen TG on Twitter. He says, should we give more chance to our youngsters in the in the starting 11? For example, Ainsley Maitland-Niles or Willock or Smith Rowe in place of Gwen Doozy. Um, like I said earlier on in the show, I am always reluctant to say that some of these players are, are ready to step up to, to the top level. Um, I think for me, out of the players that you've mentioned, the one that looks like he's got that X factor, that real something special about him is Emil Smith-Rowe. So he would be in my thinking. But also, you know, you can't write off Ainsley Maitland-Niles because he's played a, a lot more first team games than any of those players have. So he comes into the equation too. And I guess in answer to your question, when you think about the fact that we can't sign anybody um, on a permanent deal because of sort of wage restrictions and so on and so forth, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? Well, I, I guess we don't really have much choice other than to, to give some of these boys uh, a chance. Next question comes from Dro the Gooner. He says, who do you trust more as far as player acquisitions go, Sven or Raul? Well... If I'm being honest, I don't know a great deal about either of them. I mean, with Sven Mislintat, whenever we talk about him, people just band names about the names that he supposedly discovered. So given that you don't really hear that about Raul Sanlehi, I guess you've got a side with Sven Mislintat because he's got a proven track record. But saying that, Raul is a, a proven director of football. He's done a fantastic job at Barcelona. Let's face it, you don't last there for as long as he did if you're not any good at your job. Um, but in terms of player acquisitions, I would probably just about side with Sven. Now, um, this next one comes from Richard Wright. Uh, he says, are you nervous, Raul Unai? Sorry, let me rephrase that. Are you nervous Raul or Unai will report 
will recruit, I can't even speak, players not suitable for the Premier League or that are too old. It seems that Unai is desperately trying to salvage his reputation. Surely Sven could have played a major part. Um, You know what, it's always a risk, isn't it? When you've got a manager that's not worked in the Premier League before, it's always a risk that the players he fancies or, or the players he likes just won't cut it in this division. But I guess if you're a good enough footballer, you'll make it anywhere. Um, I do truly believe that. I do think that there are leagues that suits, uh, that suit sorry, certain players better. But ultimately, if you're a top level footballer, you should be able to play anywhere. Uh, so those are the questions for this week. Um, thanks to all of you who sent them in. Apologies to those who I haven't got around to. Um, I'm a little bit pushed for time. Um, again, I, I feel like I always say that. Um, let me get your predictions up. I did ask as well uh, for you guys to send some predictions ahead of the game at the weekend. Uh, the first one comes from Marble Halls TV on Twitter. He says Arsenal 2, Chelsea 1. Zero nil on Twitter says 2-1 as well. But this time to Chelsea. Ooh. Uh, yeah, so two one Chelsea from zero nil. Fabio Carvalho says it's going to be a very difficult game, a lot of stake. Arsenal have to put in an excellent performance and have to be solid at the back. To be honest, I'm not worried about Chelsea. I'm worried about Hazard. My God, I've got right to the end of that one, and there's no bloody prediction. <laughs> the next one is from Benjamin Dunn. He says, "Hate to say it, but we're going to lose three one." And Colin Lawrence says two two, but that's being optimistic. I've already given you mine one one. Um, so I'm going to stick with it. And that brings us to the end of another show, the preview show. Uh, this, of course, is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Acast, YouTube, um, Spotify, and, and various other platforms. Hit the like button, please. Hit the subscribe button, please. Leave us a comment. We always want to know what you guys are thinking too. And don't forget, we're back on Tuesday with a review of the Chelsea game with former Arsenal striker Jeremy Ali Adier. So you won't want to miss that one. Um, and uh, until Tuesday, have a good weekend and uh, let's hope for a good result. Come on, you gunners. <laughs>